This is the Brad House Sports Show. And now for this week's completely different and humorous perspective on everything sports, here's Brad House Mike and Sidekick. Well, here we go again. Another um, week of sports and another opportunity for all of us here to analyze, break down, opinionate, and, uh, well, poke fun at some of the biggest sports events of of the past week. (laughs) And as we've been doing, uh, we're going to get a little extra bit of help this week from our own Uncle Mark joining us again via Skype. Mark, always Quiet, fun to be I'm here. Broadcasting. Always fun to be here. Absolutely. We appreciate you sticking around with us and putting up with our nonsense. Yeah, well, another fun week. Now, listen, man, before we yep. get uh, going too far, I just wanted to give a shout out yep. on behalf of all of us here at the Frat House to our uh, very good uh, Facebook friend, Kimber Sue. Yep. Uh, she's recovering from a recent surgery and doing well. Um, she was, of course, stalwart with us uh, and came in second place in our NASCAR yeah. uh, Fantasy League last year. So we certainly wish her the best and hope she's going to be joining us in, what, another three, four weeks? Absolutely. Uh, we'll be we got yep. the, uh, starting it up. So, Kim, listen up. Uh, get, get well so that you can be ready to go with NASCAR because that will be kicking yep. up, as we just said. When, when is Daytona? Because you're going to be there. I 23rd. Mean, you, got, you got the calendar kicked out. I know you got uh, the X's through the calendar. Oh, yeah. What are we it's, talking? Four I weeks? believe it's the, uh, I want to say 22nd, 23rd. 23rd. Yeah. yeah, 22nd, 23rd. Okay, yeah. so we're yep. talking, we're talking. 20, 23rd, yeah, we're with 39 talking. days. I know it's going to interfere, I believe, with that one show that we would be doing that very evening. So it might yeah. be like five weeks from now. Yeah. All right, but, yeah, but anyhow, need, Kim, you got to get wet. Well, yeah, we need her to get yeah, better absolutely. because I need some competition because oh, nobody else around here. Listen to this. Sorry. You know. Got to knock off this Jimmy Johnson of the frat house over here, Kim. (laughs) Hurry back. (laughs) All right. I goofed. Well, listen, uh, all that good stuff. And, well, we're going to kick it right off uh, this evening with our top stories of the week. And we're going to start it out over in Major League Baseball. Uh, First was the announcement on Saturday that Major League Baseball uh, arbitrator Frederick Horowitz uh, had lessened the suspension penalty against New York Yankees third baseman Alex Rodriguez from 211 games to 162 for his role in the biogenesis PED scandal. Uh, That turns out to be a reduction of 49 games. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, it equates to exactly one full MLB season. Now, for me, that leads kind of leads me to the question of, uh, well, well, you know, what what does that mean? Does that mean that A-Rod then would be eligible in the event the Yankees were to see postseason play this season? Excuse me. But then the following evening on Sunday, Tony Bosch, the founder and proprietor of Biogenesis, the Florida-based anti-aging clinic, appeared on 60 Minutes. In that interview, Bosch indicates that uh, he injected A-Rod with multiple banned substances on multiple occasions, as well as placing him on a daily regimen and PED plan that allowed Rodriguez to escape detection. Now, a couple of things stu- uh, stuck out to me about all of this. First was the timing of the announcement by the Major League Baseball arbitrator, which hit just one day before Bosch's appearance. And so uh, I kind of opened it up to you, gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I throw the question out. Why the need to lower the suspension game number? Uh, Alex Rodriguez said it really has been less than forthcoming uh, and has really gone through this whole process kicking and screaming. Uh, he has bad mouthed the administration of Major League Baseball and really has placed the entire sport in a very, very bad light. And in light of that, it seems to me that uh, Major League Baseball would have wanted to really forcefully enact their penalties, and yet we lessen them. And, you know, this reminds me of so many times that we hear about penalties in all sports, NASCAR, football. It doesn't make it seem to make any difference. Hey, we're going to level a fine, and then what do we do? We come back and we lessen it. <laughs> Any thoughts? Sidekick. <clears throat> well, you know, that's the thing. You know, you go to arbitration in the hopes that it's going to get lowered a little bit, um, which, you know, in this case, it, it got lowered a little bit. Um, but, you know, he's a toy. I, I hate this guy so much. Yeah. Um, well, no, with I this hear whole you. Thing, you know. You're not the only um, one. You know, the fact that we're even talking about this. 
you know, um, <coughs> you know, I just wish he would just take his suspension, go away, go away and retire. Even better, yeah. you know. I mean, the funny thing that came out, you know, we wa we sat here and we watched the sixty minutes thing, yep. and apparently the guy's afraid of needles. I don't know. <laughs> it's just a little prick. I mean, come on. Yeah. yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> Uncle Mark, you want to weigh in on this? Just ask Madonna about a little prick, I guess. She could probably tell you something about it. Well, here's the thing that strikes me real fast about this story. Number one, he's not fighting uh, just MLB, that uh, Rodriguez now. He's fighting the whole system because he's also uh, listed uh, the uh, Players Association among those people he's really pissed off at. So he's fighting against himself like on every front. So that really tells you something. The other thing about this suspension, um, he's got a pretty uh, uh, cutthroat attorney, and I think yeah. his attorney is kind of scared, if you can use that. I use it loosely, scared the MLB back to a corner of saying, well, you know what, suspend the guy, but do it for a round number. He's out for a year. He can't be coming up with this uh, generic 211. Where'd you get that number? He hasn't been proven uh, guilty of anything yet, and you really haven't, like, put him uh, statistically and on the record as being a bad abuser. So uh, it's all bad. I'm with Psychic. This is just, ugh, it's so bad to eat this, smell this, and drink this again. It's bad. Yeah, the, I, I mean, in bad. some respects, it's, I guess it's good that he'll, you know, hopefully it would be nice if he just quietly disappears for, the, for this season that's coming up. I don't think it's going to be quiet, though. I mean, yeah. he's already indicated it's not going to be quiet. Oh, well, no, his attorney be won't keep training. it down. Well, oh, you uh, know? Because he's allowed to be there. But, you know, I really like, kind of wish the guy would just disappear. I mean, you know, I think, I think for all of us who are real sports fans, that's kind of like what we would like to see. At the same time, I think for purists in the game, maybe it's not what we want to see. Because, you know, you start to wonder whether, in fact, maybe this really does need to play out in order to kind of clean house on Major League Baseball once and for all. I don't know. Um, but it was interesting. I kind of felt like, Hey, why don't you just leave the suspension where it is? Leave it at 211. If that's what it was originally, just leave it there. All right, another story that uh, really isn't getting quite the play that I kind of thought it would, but I think is quite significant, is that on Tuesday, U.S. District Judge Anita Brody, right here in Philadelphia, turned down the NFL's proposed $765 million settlement of the class action concussion lawsuit claiming that she did not believe that the settlement amount was high enough. This decision stamped out a settlement that took months to negotiate and continues to keep this controversy now on the front burner. Now, it seems to me that neither side might be too pleased with this decision, as it's probably going to mean that the NFL will be paying out more than the nearly $1 billion that they would have paid out uh, in, in the payout plus legal fees. And for the NFLPA, it further delays any financial recovery for its player victims. <coughs> now, on one hand, the NFL is willing to negotiate a settlement. Th that kind of indicates to me the fact that they do not want this going to litigation. But perhaps, again, this is another one of those cases like the A-Rod situation, where for the sake of the NFL, perhaps that might be the best strategy. All right, Sidekick, I'm going to open it up again with you because you've done a lot of research on concussions. Mm -hmm and what the ramifications are. First of all, what's your feelings on this situation? And number two, do you in fact, would you in fact feel that perhaps maybe 765 million isn't enough from the NFL? Should they in fact have to be paying out more? Well, I don't, you know, at, when you look at it at a very high level, you say 765 million to pay out for, you know, players. But when you actually go in and you look at the details, they're talking about this amount of money needs to last 65, 65 years, years correct. to pay for, you know, players down the road. I don't think 765 is enough. Wow. If you're talking about having to pay 65 years, you, you know, you put inflation and all that other stuff in it, you know, I, I agree with the judge. I don't think 765 is enough. Wow. When, when you look at it from this money needs to be around for 65 years. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, obviously, some of that I, 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 you know, I don't know exactly what the structure is financially of the way that it would mm -hmm. be determined. But I would think that some of it would have been annuitized. So in some well, cases, would it, would, yeah, it, it would, it would right. be gaining interest, 
and then some of the interest would be being paid out as well. So in fact, the initial $765 million principal would actually probably expand and balloon over a period of time to being actually more than that in the payout. Um, this is an industry that's worth uh, $9 billion, right. uh, I guess what they're saying, a year. <coughs> and the NFL was willing to put out $1 billion this year to settle this situation. We're talking about more than 10% of the value of the entire league. Uh, can we really go much more than that? I mean, seriously, I mean, fairly? I mean, that's my whole point, fairly. Well, you know, one of the, th one of the things I was reading, you know, or another thing I was reading was that in this plan, players that had less than five years in the league yep. potentially could get no money mm -hmm. for settlement. It, it was aggregated. Yes, I read so, that. So you know, there's you know, it, there was different things. It was there were how long you were in you there know, were your age, correct? How long you were in the league? It was you know, or do you have Lou Gehrig's disease? Do you have dementia? Right. Or you know, what level are you at? You know, so you know, again, I, it's hard. It's it's hard to come down and really come up with a figure right that can compensate for this yeah. you know what I mean? and i think that's part of the problem you know yeah you look at 765 million that's a lot of money it is yep. you know you know mm -hmm. what i mean and then the lawyers you know those greedy guys you know they're taking 112 they're getting 100 mm, yeah 113 million or 122 or something, yeah. or something like yeah, that yeah because the nfl had budgeted 900 million dollars of which 115 million were going to be going i think or 135 million are going to the lawyers and the and the, and the legal fees. Oh, yeah. So it's outrageous what the attorneys are getting but, off of this. You know, but at the same but time, but nobody's screwing with them. They want to screw with the NFL. You know what I mean? Sure. And you know, but you talk about you know it's a tenth of one year. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's only extrapolated like said, out over a, 65. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think I I think. That it needs to be higher. All right. I mean, well, I don't. I don't think the players are being greedy. I don't think you know. But I, I think that that number does need to be higher. Uncle Mark, where are you standing on this one? Oh no, I think you guys have covered it. I think you've covered all sides of it. Absolutely right. I mean, they're talking. Uh, if I understood it right, uh, it may not be a, enough to cover twenty thousand, twenty thousand retired players. But that's players. not what the initial class lawsuit was. I think <clears> that was, that number was what. That was four thousand. Yeah, so I mean, well, we're not forty-five, talking, a little more than forty-five hundred. You know, I love how I love how the one side wants to trumpet things up and make it more than it is. But go ahead. Well, I mean, I guess they're basing it on what a projection. It's a kind of a dark black projection, yeah. but we're making projections about what the uh, injury rate is going to be in the future. And well, again, we're looking at uh, it in the crucible of over the next sixty-five years. So suddenly, the judicial uh, system is the game is going company. to change. We yeah. can we can bet the game is going to change, and and this might be enough money because if they change the game and everybody starts wearing flags, and we ultimately have professional flag football maybe concussions will be a thing of the past and they'll be looking to dip into the 765 million as a reserve down the road <laughs> or or maybe we need to put in a you know a caveat in there that says hey if we reach a point where we're not the 65 years and we've run out there needs to be some sort of uh, stopgap you know uh, not review this, uh, or you know something because it would suck to get I don't know, 40 years into it, and then the money be gone, and then for the next 25 years, those player, those folks who are entitled to some sort of compensation because of the concussions So we're suggesting something similar to what our own Congress does like twice a year. A stopgap right. measure. <laughs> yeah. well, it, otherwise, exactly. we're gonna, otherwise, honestly, we're going to sequester. Is this the NFL <laughs> fiscal cliff we're approaching? Yeah. Well, <laughs> honestly, it's like Social Security. If you think about it, well, it's... Well, that's the way I was thinking. I mean, in some respects, the judicial sort of system... It is. The judicial system here security is, playing, measure. is playing insurance company. Yeah. So. I mean, maybe the players need to pay into it. Bah, bah. I'm okay with I that. I don't know. Just saying. All right. Well, those are our two big stories uh, for this week. Um, all right. We're better than halfway through the NHL season. And we thought this would be a good time. Uh, to, it's uh, always a good time. Absolutely. I'm here at Frat House Sports. is a good time. Uh, uh, Any time's a good time to take a look at, uh, well, uh, well, talk anything sports, <laughs> but to take a look at each of the NHL divisions and see where things are stacking up, excuse me, in the standings. And our NHL chat this week is brought to you by our friends down in Baltimore at Herb FM Sports Radio. 
Be sure you're checking them out over at www.herbfm.com. And with that, we bring in our hat trick segment for with our own Uncle Mark. All right. Uh, let's take a look at things, uh, Uncle Mark. We got the Atlantic Division posted up here at this point right now. And uh, I guess my first question to you would be just looking at this, and we're going to be looking at the other four divisions in a moment. Uh, and I think you might know where I'm going here. Uh, would it be fair to say that this might be the weakest division in all of the NHL? Uh, Atlantic division, huh? Yeah, yeah. 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 I would have to say so. Uh, I'll tell you what. We talked about this like nine, eight, nine weeks ago. We, we did an initial sort of update of the league. And um, in this particular example of the Atlantic, interestingly, your, your four leaders are virtually the same with one exception, and that being uh, the Detroit Red Wings, yep. where we to cut the line today right. would, would be excluded from uh, consideration as, uh, you know, coming out of the Atlantic uh, in the top four. Right. I don't know. I don't have a problem with that. Well, well okay. I hear you. <laughs> a little surprise. A little surprise, only because Detroit was really, you know, going into the year, they were figured to be, you know, contending. Uh, Montreal's risen nicely, uh, over that same period of time, and they've actually been sort of the one that displaced uh, Detroit. And obviously what we've done here is in each of the cases, you're going to see a black line, and that d indicates where things would be if the season were to end right now. Detroit would be on the outside looking in. Yep, they're I go on the back, other side of the cliff. I would go back to that, though, Welcome, Mark. Uh, obviously they can still get in, but we've got four pretty strong teams up at the top in order for them to get in, we would have to see a little bit of diminution going on over on the other side in the Metropolitan Division, yes? Well, absolutely, because we know uh, when it comes to playoff time, they're going to look at this in, as, as basically two halves of the league. So uh, the whole of the Eastern Conference is looked at when they get to play, the playoff time uh, about who's going who's gonna to go forward. Uh, looking in that Metropolitan Division, uh, you know, the team to beat uh, overall in the East, we, we see it, is, is Pittsburgh Penguins. Right. That doesn't matter. You come from the Atlantic side or the Metropolitan side. Um, and I'll tell you, this too, uh, over the last nine weeks, your, your four top uh, teams basically have remained uh, the same, uh, with one exception, and that being Carolina, which has uh, kind of dropped down. The Hurricanes are experiencing a, a terrible hurricane, and they've really dropped. They plummeted say, over the last like several weeks. And Philadelphia <clears throat> has moved up and taken their spot. Well, and there's a question I've got for you, because, I mean, obviously we, we, we know all too well what the travails were of the Philadelphia Flyers, particularly early on in the season. Uh, are they truly a second place team? And I guess when I ask that, what I'm saying is I'm kind of discounting them as a second place team. Uh, they really strike me as being really mediocre. And I guess the other question you might have already answered, and that was that I had written down here, is Carolina really that bad? Yeah, well, interestingly, uh, I guess the first one first, the Flyers, uh, listen, you know, at this point, look, I hate to say it like this, but look what they're up against. Uh, the Capitals really are, are, are strictly middling. Um, to me, they're a, they're a viable bubble team by the time we really get to the playoffs. The Rangers, the Devils, uh, I had included the Flyers into that to make it a, a trifecta uh, nine weeks ago of just real mediocrity. Uh, the Hurricanes... Right now, I can't explain. Honestly, I can't explain. That's a, that should be a stronger uh, operation than it is. And right now, they're just doing terrible, and they've really fallen off. Yep. Um, you know, between the two, looking at the East, your Atlantic has, I think, a few more powerful uh, hitters in there. And I would throw maybe the Capitals and the Penguins in from the Metropolitan, and I think that's how it's going to shake down when we really get to uh, your, playoff, uh, your playoff time and we're looking at the East. Well, right. with, the, with, with the Flyers, it's all about culture, right? Oh, well, that's I mean, what that's, we know. Yeah, well, you know. Yeah, yeah, and the culture is fine. We know that. The culture is just fine and, and has been nightmare. for almost 40 years. Absolutely. Active yogurt cultures is what it's all about, really. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's head west. How about that one? We'll go over and take a look at the Central Division. And uh, this is going to make Sidekick very happy because the St. Louis Blues holding strong up there in the second spot right behind the Blackhawks. I'm not happy about that. Why the hell are they up there? Well, that's what I'm meaning. You're, you're, you're going to be. No, happy they shouldn't about be up there. The Blues should be up there. Well, that's the Hawks what, should be uh, down uh, here. All right, you got. Okay. Uh, Come on. You know, uh, Uncle Mark, we're just talking about. You know, when we start taking a look at this Western side, this is kind of a reverse of what you would anticipate being the stereotype of hockey 
where you expect the powerhouses anymore to be in the eastern section of the country, not the western section. And yet, when we look at both of these divisions in the west, it's, it's insane. These, the western side is so much stronger. Go ahead, give me your seer read on it. Yeah, no, there's no two ways around it. And, you know, uh, you can probably see behind me, I've got the flag up here for, uh, yeah, for Sidekick uh, tonight. And <clears throat> tell you what, I, there's, probably, there's probably attention being paid, and there should be, to that St. Louis Blues team. Because when you look at their differential in points, uh, there's almost nobody in the West that can best them. Uh, when you look at the, the number of the few, the very small number of losses that they have, yep. uh, it puts them amongst the best uh, in the West. And then compared to the East, we've already said it, the, yeah. the, the West is, is so much stronger yep. than the East. Yep. Um, I think you're in for some very, very, uh, some good rivalry. I think your most heated and fun action going into the playoffs is going to come from uh, that, Western, uh, that Western Conference. And in the Central, Blackhawks, Blues, Avalanche, Wild. Who else do you really want to see there? I mean, that's it right there. Uh, in my view, you could cut it. Uh, the Stars, the Predators, the Jets, they're terribly pedestrian. Uh, they're going to fall off the map, and nobody's going to miss them until next year. Yeah, and it's interesting, <coughs> going back to talking about that strength of the East and the West again, one of the observations I had made was that, interestingly, the second and third place teams in both the Atlantic and Metropolitan Divisions wouldn't even make the cut right now in the West. I was going to say, if the Stars... If the stars were in the exactly, east, they might be in the picture. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, you're absolutely right. And if the stars, yeah. the stars were aligned, the uh, Eagles would be in the playoffs too. So. <laughs> Let's go take a look real quick at the Pacific Division, where the number one team in the NHL right now are the Anaheim Ducks. Where the hell did they come from? Um, and one other observation I wanted to make real quick as well: uh, across the NHL, we frequently talk about the fact that. Hey, we've got weak market teams, and where would the NHL do themselves a favor but to put themselves in stronger market teams, uh, you know, up in Canada? Um, and yet, we've got four teams right now, Canadian teams, Ottawa, Winnipeg, Calgary, and Edmonton, all of whom are below the line. So, obviously, they're not, you know, we've got teams that are playing not quite as well, but nonetheless, they're getting the, they're getting the I mean, they're getting support to the extent that they're being viable, but we're always thinking in terms of how can we make a team stronger? Hey, put one up in Canada, and yet the Canadian teams aren't doing quite as well. But Mark, talk yeah, to us about the- Yeah, but they're selling out though. Obviously, obviously. Talk to us about the Pacific Division. What about the Anaheim Ducks team? Are they for real? Well, the Anaheim Ducks have been for real from the get-go. They have uh, jumped out ahead of every other uh, franchise in the league. They did so in the second week of the season, and they've never looked back. Um, I, whatever they're doing right, um, I think other teams should take a good hard look and try to try to do it for themselves. Uh, they're growing that team from within. They've got great solid goaltending. Uh, they too have a ridiculously small eight losses all year long. So yep. that tells you they know how to play defense. Uh, they too have a tremendous swing in their uh, differential of points for versus points against. Right. I mean, you know, they, they're they're scoring, uh, they're outscoring. Uh, what they're giving up by 50 goals. I mean, just tremendous. They've got a nice win streak going. They've been doing this all year long, too, of putting together six- and seven-game winning streaks. Right now they're running on an eight-game winning streak. There's no stopping the Ducks, and uh, everybody should take note and everybody should worry about them. Uh, your Sharks, your Kings, your Canucks, uh, well, pretty much that's, that's how it's been. Uh, the Canucks and the, and the Kings have traded spots uh, in, in that Pacific. But I think this is really one of your strongest ones uh, right there, your Pacific. I, I really do like, uh, I, think you've got, I think you've got some power out there. You might be a little more balanced in the Central, for instance, St. Louis and, uh, and Blackhawks, a little more balanced uh, in, in, in terms of their strength and weakness, but I think you've got some real power there on the Pacific side. Um, yeah, we talked about it last week. Canucks, uh, they're selling out every game. The Flames, they're selling out every game. The Oilers are selling out every game. People are not only uh, supporting this terrible, these terrible franchises in terms of the wins, losses, terrible, put it like that. These teams are well-loved, and people are going to the gate for them. It's not sellout, and, you know, we're getting the blackout so we can watch from home kind of thing. Right. It's really interesting what's going on. They love that game in Canada, and they'll even love losers. 
that LA Kings team, real quick, just to sum it all up, that LA Kings team right now, sitting in third spot right now in the Pacific Division. Yet, we have seen two years in a row, that team usually comes on in the second half. Can we expect the same thing? Or are they the giants of the NHL? Well, I'll be honest with you right now. If you go nose to nose, you know, you could put them up against somebody in the East like Boston, uh, maybe uh, the Lightning. Uh, I think certainly Montreal, uh, clearly the Penguins, even the Flyers. And and that L.A. team is, is eminently beatable. Um, they're not going to necessarily they'll make a, a little noise, I think, in, in the postseason play. But I think the L.A. Kings really are playing for the regular year. I don't see them going deep in the postseason right now. Will they come on? No, I think what we've seen with this is a little different complexion. The L.A. Kings have been steady. They're going to stay steady. Uh, they're going to run mid-pack. They're going to hope to get a playoff uh, berth. That's the way I see it. And if they do, maybe around. All right. Well, there you go. There's our NHL chat for this week. And, again, make sure you tune in to Herb FM Sports over on the Internet at www.herbfm.com. Um, and, again, uh, Saturdays. That seems to be the day they've been rebroadcasting. It's over there Saturday afternoons. Yep. And if you check Saturday morning on our Facebook page, <coughs> uh, you can find out exactly what time you can hear the replay of this show over on HerbFM.com. Are you right. telling me that's on radio? That is on internet radio. Yes, I can't believe it. Yes. Actually, I can. I've listened to it. It's actually very quite good. It, it very, is good. very, very quite good. It is good to hear. Yeah. Back in. No compliment to Saturday. That. No football. Right. So, so nothing to stop everybody from giving it a listen. Okay. Except Big. my cursing, whining, and screaming. That might get it. There you go. <laughs> big, big weekend of NFL football coming our way as we've got two absolutely terrific conference championship games on schedule. Uh, but before we get to our picks for those games, uh, we've got some other football chat. That'll take us, uh, I don't know, about four minutes or so. And now, four minutes of football. All righty. Now, following just one season as the offensive coordinator for the San Diego Chargers, Ken Wisenhut will be taking over the head coaching uh, position of the Tennessee Titans. Not unfamiliar with that role, Wisenhut served as the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals for six seasons from 2007 to uh, 2012, where he had a record of 45-51, 45 51, 45 and 51. Uh, two winning seasons and took the cards to the Super Bowl in 2009 uh, for the 2008 season. At his introductory press conference the other day, though, Wisenhut indicated that along with his head coaching duties, he intended to be the guy calling the offensive plays, quote, unless somebody tells me I can't. Now, some may not think this is a terrific move for the Titans. Former Cardinals quarterback Matt Leiner stated the other day on Fox Sports Live that it was Kurt Warner not Wisenhunt, that ran the offense during the Cards' Super Bowl run. Leinert said, uh, I looked at his tenure in Arizona, only two years, he had success, and in those two years, Kurt Warner ran that football team. I was part of it. Every single Monday, Kurt Warner would come in and implement 20 to 30 new plays, which he would say, I want these in my game plan. Well, perhaps maybe that's why Wisenhunt indicated that his ideal Titans QB would be Kurt Philip Roethlisberger. Uh, real quick, Mark, uh, you followed that Cardinals team. What do you make of this? Anything to it? Well, first of all, Matt Leinert is... is <laughs> I knew where you were going. Come on. Come on. Do I, I mean, I'm not even going to go there. So uh, this guy's trying to make uh, yep. tomorrow's money on, on absolute yesterday news. Uh, he was a terrible, terrible example of anybody uh, in professional football. Um, and, you know, not for nothing. Wizen Hunt did what he could with that Arizona team. Do I think the guy's a, a, a genius? No. Um, he's got his work uh, cut out for him. Uh, when you look at this roster out there in the Titans world, uh, they got a great young quarterback, Rusty Smith. <laughs> no, that's not a joke. His name really is Rusty Smith, and I think that pretty well names the entire Titans setup. You don't have too, many, uh, too much to work with out there. I mean, what do you got, Chris Johnson? Uh, you know, can we name a couple more people that are out there in, in Tennessee that are even uh, worth talking about? Delaney Walker, maybe. Uh, come on, help me out. Kendall Wright. I'm struggling for some names. That's a terrible right. organization. Good luck, Wiz. Good luck. 
All right, there you have it. Uh, call a uh, hype. Uh, yeah, I can't even talk. Uh, hypocrisy? hypocrisy. Yes, hypocrisy. Hip yes, I can't even speak. I call it hypocrisy violation. Hypocrisy. The Boston hypocrisy. Globe. The Boston Globe. In an editorial released this week, the newspaper Brass wrote about the Washington Redskins name change, stating, quote, the exploitation, prejudice, stereotyping, and betrayal of Native Americans by the U.S. government and many other Americans is encoded in the term Redskins. Daniel Snyder would gain more by showing respect to those who are offended by the name and opening a new chapter in Washington football history. Well, to provide just a bit of history, the Washington Redskins were established in 1932 as the Boston Braves and then later changed their name to the Boston Redskins in 1935 <coughs> to differentiate their football team from their baseball team of the same name. Uh, so we sincerely thank the good folks in Boston for their foresight and forethought 79 years ago in naming the team. Now, in the meantime, do yourselves a favor. Concentrate on the Red Sox and the Celtics and mind your own damn business. All right. Uh, last but Don't not least. Give me none of your back talk. Yeah, really. Thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, in what I think is probably the most amusing non-story of the week, let's judge the wardrobe of San Francisco 49ers head coach Jim Harbaugh. Why not? His wife did. Uh, Sarah Harbaugh, <coughs> excuse me, was on a San Fran radio station this week discounting any approval of a Jim stereotypical sideline attire, a long sleeve black shirt and pleated khaki pants. Uh, in fact, she said, I will not take the blame for his outfits. Uh, she uh, was telling 99.7 uh, radio in uh, San Francisco. Uh, I've thrown them away many, many times. I've asked him, please, pleats are gone. I threw them out. And when he went to the combine, he found a Walmart. They were $8. $8. All right. Uh, if the 49ers me. make it to the Super Bowl, all of us here at Frat House Sports are going to start a movement to get Harbaugh to come out on the sideline dressed like Tom Landry. Come on, truly. I think that would be terrific if he just came out, you know, just as a gaff. Tom Landry. Yeah, it's another reason to root for the 49ers this week. Okay, really? I mean, we, we got uh, friggin' Belichick walking around in that god-awful hideous sweatshirt. I know! I, I, and, and we're you know, I was waiting for a hoodie. Like, I was waiting for on. somebody to mention the <laughs> filthy hoodie. Looks like he just changed the oil in his pickup truck. In, <laughs> and he's wearing that on the sideline. I'm with you. Oh, outstanding. I know, really. I don't think it looks all that bad, but that's, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, hey, listen, this guy's going to win a Super Bowl, he hopes. So, quite frankly, if he wanted to wear pants from a company called Dickies and uh, some sandals from Buster Brown, he could probably get away with it. You're not kidding. <laughs> Who cares, really? Um, all right. But listen, since we are talking about rooting interests and who you're going to root for this weekend, uh, let's get into the two big games uh, of the conference championship weekend. And uh, honest to God, folks, uh, the football gods have really smiled upon all of us with these matchups. Um, you have and our to picks, ask me nicely. And, and our picks for uh, uh, this second to the last week of the NFL football uh, this season are brought to you by our friends Carl and Jim over at CLW83.com. And be sure you're checking those guys out over there as well. Check out their entire network. And when he says the gods have smiled on us, he means himself. No, no, no. No, come on, you women. Seriously, we couldn't ask for of of the of the you know uh, uh, eight game, eight teams that were playing last week. Mm -hmm. This has set up beautifully. Seriously, oh, for no. so many different reasons. I mean, you know, with this game coming up, you've got the two young gun quarterbacks yep. against the other side, where you're going to have the two old timer kind of quarterbacks going up against each other. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many reasons why this is just perfect. But let's go take a look real quick. <laughs> We're going to start it off. And it's called Peyton Manning. No, it's not. No, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> no, you can't beat this one on me. This is a Ride him, cowboy. Oh, boy. All right, we're going to start it off with the, with the uh, second of the two games, and that's the San Francisco 49ers, who are the number five seed at the Seattle Seahawks, the number one seed. <laughs> and that will be the late game on Sunday at 6.30. And the 49ers advance to the NFC Championship for the third time in three seasons after beating the Carolina Panthers 23-10. to 10. 
And it was a close game with the Panthers leading the game 10-6 up until right before halftime <laughs> when a one-yard pass from Kaepernick to Vernon Davis put the 49ers in front 13-10. Following that, though, the 49ers' defense shut out the Panthers throughout the entire second half. Frank Gore ran for 84 yards. Anquan Bolden was in beast mode with eight receptions and 136 yards. But the name of the game was the defense for the 49ers, which hit Cam Newton nine times, sacked him five, and intercepted two. Now, that was the exact same defensive game plan that we saw with Seattle Seahawks, who beat the New Orleans Saints 23 to 15. The Saints didn't score a single point until early in the fourth quarter. And the Seahawks had a 16-0 lead at halftime. Now, like Kaepernick, though, Wilson was, in my opinion, strictly mediocre, thrown for only 103 yards on a 9 of 18 day. Uh, this game sidekick, if you were, uh, yeah, I mean, frequently you've referred to these kinds of things. This is an old fashioned slobber knocker. Yep. Seattle is favored by three and a half. Vegas is expecting a defensive matchup as well, as the over under in this is a mere 39. That's it. Uncle Mark, I'm going to kick it off with you. This could be a goodie. What do you got? Oh, this one is so good, actually. I mean, because you're right. That's exactly what we got here. We got a slobber knocker in the division uh, it, on the left coast. I mean, everything about this uh, says two franchises that hate each other. Yeah. Uh, and full, of, full of talent, too. I mean, no matter which way you look uh, on either side of the roster, this one was real tough for me to call. And from a fantasy standpoint, I'm playing uh, players from both sides. Uh, I'm going to go with who I want and really who I think at the end of the day it's going to be, and that is the Niners. Um, although, if, if the Seahawks win, I'm not going to be surprised. Right. But I am taking the underdog. I'm going to go with the Niners. I'm going with Vernon Davis and Kaepernick and uh, uh, Anquan Bolden and, uh, you know, the likes of Alden Smith on defense. I've bought in. Yep. Well, you know, this game, as you allude to, is going to be a slobber knocker. Yes, it's going to be. I mean, this is going to be you saw with both a those defensive games yep. showcase. <coughs> um, and it's going to be, you know, who can, you know, can we see March, March, Marshawn Lynch break through? Can we see Gore break through? Mm -hmm. You know, what? how are the quarterbacks each going to react? And I think it's going to come down to each team playing the defenses. Mm-hmm on what brought them to the table. Yep. They're all aggressive. So you're going to see both teams trying to trying to get them to overcommit and you know and try and do some uh, some uh, what's the word I'm looking for misdirection and mm -hmm. stuff like that to catch these overly aggressive defenses off guard so you can put some points up something, on them. something on the board. Something, right. something on the board. So but I I'm giving it to the twelfth man in Seattle. How about that? I mean, I, I, on paper, I think it you could flip a coin. Yeah. But with the this game being in Seattle, I think Seattle is has owned San Francisco at Seattle. You know, Seattle's going to. I think they're going to eat this one out. I'm not. It's not going to be. It's not going to be like earlier in the season when they blew out the Niners. Mm -hmm. The Niners are a different team now. But I, you know, it, it's it's going to be a fight, man. Yep. All right, I'm going to break the tie, obviously. Uh, but I'm in agreement with both of you that this game literally could go either way. And I'm going to pick one, but I'm going to tell you right now, it wouldn't surprise me if the other one comes out uh, uh, on top of it. So I'm going to go with the 49ers. This is our third time going around <coughs> into the NFC Championship. And I like their experience a little bit more. I also liked, uh, I believe, I believe that Kaepernick is a little bit more capable of putting those, as you pointed out, what are going to be very stingy points up a little bit better than Russell Wilson does. I have not been impressed with Wilson in the second half of this particular season, and I wasn't terribly impressed with him last week. I really felt it was the defense that won the game. I think Kaepernick is a little more capable. I'm going to give this one by a nose, as we were all saying, to the 49ers. All right. <coughs> Let's go take a look at the New England Patriots, the number two seed in the AFC uh, traveling out to the Denver Broncos, number one seed, three o'clock game on Sunday. 
We've got the perfect storm matchup here as we have a number two versus the number one. The Patriots last week dismantled the Indianapolis Colts last Saturday evening, uh, 43 to 22. Thanks really to two folks, Andrew Luck, who threw four interceptions, and LeGarrette Blount, who uh, became the Pats' flavor of the week with, count them, four, four touchdowns. Uh, but you got to throw in the Patriots' defense. Where the hell did they come from? Along with the four interceptions, uh, they hit Luck ten times, sacked them three times. Brady was okay, but it was obvious that the evil genius's plan was to run the ball and bring the D. So Brady really didn't need to be the, the, the savior flavor of the week. Uh, despite the score now over on the other side, the Broncos really never had a problem with the San Francisco Chargers. In their 24-7 win, uh, they were never behind on the scoreboard. Manning went 25 of 36 for 230 yards, two touchdowns and an interception. The Broncos brought a balanced attack with 82 yards on the ground from Moreno and touchdowns from Demarius Thomas and Wes Walker, who was back for the first game after missing a few. Uh, the question in this upcoming game will be whether uh, Manning's Omaha run play, pass play, play action, pass, depending on the wind, which way they're going the quarter, and the jerseys they're wearing game plan can compete against the evil geniuses flavor of the week scheme. The Broncos are a rather surprising five and a half point favorite. Uh, and if you're true to form sidekick, uh, I know exactly where you're going. Go ahead, but give it to us. Yep. <laughs> I'm going with the Rams now. <laughs> this is my bomb diggity bomb pick of the week. Uh, sponsored by the folks over at CLW83. That's CLW, www, I'm sorry, dot CLW83.com. Um, you know, this is another matchup mm -hmm. where you could almost literally flip a coin on. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the problem with Denver is not going to be the offense this week. It's going to be the defense. They've got some major players in their defense that are out. You've got Harris out, Miller out, Wolf, right. uh, Vicks, Vickerson out. Um, so I don't think you're going to see – I don't think you're going to see an issue – with Denver putting up the points necessarily, it's going to be can they keep the Patriots from Off putting the up the points? Can right. they stop, you know, all of a sudden, you know, stud LeGarrette Blount? Mm -hmm. You know, um, are they going to be able to, con you know, contain uh, Edelman and crew? Right. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, yeah. I'm going with the Patriots. Yeah, yeah, one. I, I kind of knew that. You know, I was just checking. I think the evil genius has Manning's number. I don't care what jersey he's in. Uh huh. But I, you know, I, I just have a suspicion that they're gonna come. Well, and the over/under on this game is 56. So you're 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 pointing out yeah. exactly what it's I gonna, think Vegas one, is saying. The where, where where the the. Yes. Where the later game, yes. <laughs> the earlier game we talked about, but the later right. game is going to be that defensive, defensive. knockout. This, this is going to be, be a fireworks show. Yeah, because you know, I, I think the defenses be... on both sides are, are a suspect. I agree with you. Yeah, this is going to be exciting from the aspect of you're probably going to see points getting put up. You're going to see big plays. You're going to see, you know. Right. And you're going to hear a lot of Omaha. Yes, you will. You're going to hear a lot of Omaha. Uncle Mark. What we got here <laughs> is a failure to communicate. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. Here's what I'm going to go with. Uh, I'm going with those Broncos to break out with a bad, bad case of Humana Wanui this week. <laughs> yeah, you know, listen, the, the Patriots are going to win. It's going to be an upset. Everybody's going to sit and scratch their heads. Uh, I think they've got the, the pieces in place to, to absolutely do it. Uh, look for uh, uh, guys like Hightower to, to get in behind and, and mess, with, uh, mess with Peyton Manning. Um, you know, they, they, they've lost a couple of people, for instance, a Jared Mayo on defense and, and a couple other big heavy hitters that they can't necessarily <laughs> replace. But I would agree with Sidekick. Uh, their offensive uh, side, they've got running about as good as they've had all year, and that's with a lot of their regulars out of, out of the starting lineup. Um, I think the numbers are right on, too. I'll, I'll, I'll lay the points, and I'm taking, uh, I'm taking the Patriots to win in an upset. All right. Uh, yeah, well, uh, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, we know where you're going. It's a no-brainer. Uh, look, although I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this right now. I'm going to say this right now. If there was one part of the Patriots game that I was absolutely 
floored by last week and terribly impressed with, it was their defensive Look, game. Their defensive game. And I frankly think that if we see that same kind of defense being employed up at mile high, the Denver Broncos are going to have themselves a very, very, very long day. Look, Peyton Manning can get picked off. We've seen it many, many mm-hmm. times this year. All right? I'm not saying the guy is the man of steel. All right? That's Cam Newton. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, he, he can be beaten, and he can be beaten in his own home. It's going to, it's going to mean that, that the kind of defense that we saw from the Patriots is going to have to be there. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to happen. I think the Broncos have been way too strong this year. And frankly, I'm going to be honest with you. I think it's been a charmed season for them this year. I really do. I think right from the very first week, it was intended to be the the Broncos' year this year. And that's the way it goes. I'm going with the Broncos. I'm not surprised. (laughs) (laughs) So let it be written so let it be done. Uh, There it is. There it is. Let's go take a look at our... uh, Fantasy, our our pro our, our postseason fantasy a leaderboard, and it's moving a lot because oh, hey, it's only four weeks. It's only four weeks, folks, that we have to play this thing. Yes, I'm down there at 11, and uh, Blood Pack's up there at two, um, and then we got uh, unnecessary roughness right there. He kind of in mid pack, so and I am ready to uh, overtake. Get ready, you're going to see things move around a lot mm-hmm. after next week because yes, we're going to start having multipliers. Uh, really start to take effect. So you could really, this thing could be completely mixed up by next week at this time. All right. Yep. Uh, before we get out of here, let's go take a look at our Frat House Sports Facebook post of the week. Uh, and that was a, a short, amusing 30 second clip I posted from last week's show. Uh, and we're going to start doing this more and more, encouraging our fans to view that, that show from that particular week. And this particular clip. Got hundreds and hundreds of views, and we thank you for that. And, uh, <coughs> hey, encourage you to go take a look at the videos, of course, yes, but we encourage you to get over to our Facebook page as well. Get over there. Make it a New Year's resolution to give us a like and get two, three, four of your friends to do it as well. All right? That's what we yeah. want you to do. All right. There you have it. A big, big full week up. Oh, don't forget our Frat House Sports. Oh, I almost did it. FredHouseSports.net, too. Get over there and check that out. A couple of great articles coming this week. Facts. Uh, Absolutely. One of them coming from a brand new uh, writer we've got coming to us from Seattle, who is doing a whole thing on the Seahawks for us this week. So hopefully awesome. that'll be up by either tomorrow or Saturday. So uh, get over there, check that out. And then Uncle Mark's got a new piece coming as well on NASCAR. So uh, that'll be moving around this week as well. Frat House. Boogity, boogity, boogity. There it is. Frat House. Let's go racing, boys. Uh, let's, uh, wow. A lot of stuff. Great weekend coming up. A lot it of is. good things. Great football. Check it all out. And be back here with us next week. One more thing, though, I need you to do before next week. And that's, hey, you got to keep us real. You got to keep us live. You got to keep us going. We'll see you next.